I picked for a passage today, an uh, obscure little passage in the Old Testament, um, and so uh, I'm going to kind of weave it through the sermon, but uh, it's in 2 Kings chapter 5. I know you probably all were memorizing that today uh, to get ready for, for our, our sermon, but the um, story about a guy who has everything together. He, he is a big deal. Uh, financially, power, connections, strength, he's a military hero, he's friends with the king, he's got a great family, Every, he has everything going on, but this guy's a big deal. So, beginning of verse 5, now Naaman was commander of the army of King Aram, he was a great man in the sight of his master, and he was highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory, he was a valiant soldier. But, he had leprosy. So it says. Now, bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. And she said to the mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria, he'd cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went to his master and he told him that what the girl from Israel had said, By all means, go, the king said. I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of uh, silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. It didn't like power suits from Nordstrom. I guess. <laughs> and, I don't know why they should not say that. Uh, and the letter he took to the king of Israel said, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you can cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and he said, oh My God, can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this person send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? See, he's trying to pick a fight with me. Good thinking. So when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent a message. Why have you torn your robes? What's the big deal? Have him come to me. He'll know there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger out to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, you'll be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. And besides, aren't Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, aren't they better than any of the waters in Israel? Couldn't I have just washed up in them? So he turned and left in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, Hey, if the prophet had, said, had told you to go do some great thing, would you not have done it? So how much more when he tells you, go wash in the river and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as he'd been told, and his flesh was restored, and he became clean like that of a young boy. So Lord, teach us from this. Teach us how we might live, and how we might respond to the issues in our life, and how we might respond to you. That's our prayer today, in Jesus' name. I, I love this passage, because, um, you know, in our world, Everybody wants to be a big deal. Everybody wants to have connections and power and wealth and they want everything going for them. And usually, like I look at you all and you guys are all great. I mean, you know, you've got life. <laughs> you've got it all figured out. But like this guy, usually there's a, yeah, but there's this one thing that just holds you back. If we could just get that taken care of, then our life would be great. Right? Then it'd be great. Just this one thing. Now, the thing I love about this is the humanity of it, you know. Uh, he, he's so well respected. He's got connections and everything. And so uh, he goes to the king because and, and, he can, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and the king says, great, I'm going to send you a letter of recommendation. We'll get this taken care of. Take all this, take all this money with you, you know, and you'll give gifts. You know, how can anybody turn you down when you, when you give gifts like this, you know. Um, and uh, I, I, I checked it out, 750 pounds of silver. That's not bad. 
you know, 750 pounds. That's the poor guy who had to carry that. Um, <laughs> And the, and the ten suits, of course, you always have to have those. But, um, but I love the king's response. Immediately, he thinks it's a power struggle, right? Oh, this is a game. This, they're, they're working me. They're sending this guy here, and, they go, and if I refuse the gift, I insult him, and then we got war. Because I have just rejected his generous gift. If I take the gift and don't heal the guy, well, we got war. So we're dead anyway, right? That's what I think, because I'm always thinking about, you know, conniving and, you know, working things. And, and, and there's a, this is a trap. We're being trapped here. This is horrible. And then Elisha hears about it and says, hey, it's no big deal. Just, just send him to me. It's no big deal. Well, it was to Naaman and it was to the king and it was to everybody else. Elisha says, it's no big deal. Just, just send him to me. Then I love this. The guy comes with all of this wealth, you know, to, to bribe and to pay off and to make sure he gets the right attention. And he goes to the prophet that he's been hearing about and everything's gonna be great. And he pulls up with his entourage and Elisha doesn't even bother getting up off the couch and coming out and seeing him. How rude is that? That is just so rude. I mean, you don't treat the paper boy that way, you know? I mean, you at least invite him in, you know, give him a seven up or something. but. Elijah says to the servant, don't just go out and tell him to go jump in the lake. And that's what it says in the Hebrew, you know. But seven times, just keep jumping in the lake. And the guy cannot believe it. How, how can this be? I'm talking 750 pounds of silver. Back when silver was worth something, you know. And gold and those Nordstrom clothes. And, and the guy won't even come out and say hello. And so he left in a rage. I love that. Because that's what, that's what we would have done, right? This isn't what we expected. You know, we come to church, we expect certain things. You know, we want it to be a certain way. We want, you know, yeah, pastor's got to wave his hands over you the right way, and we've got to sing the right way. Well, we got all that today, okay? So, <laughs> yeah, but um, he left. Forget it. I'm not doing this. Homie, don't play this game. You know, we're out of here. And... Uh, and, and his servant said, well, if he would have had you do something really big, you would have done it. Well, of course, because my life, I'm a big deal. I want to do the big thing. I want to do the hard thing. I want to do the challenge. I want that. He goes, well, how about you just do the little thing and go do what he says. Now, I look at this and I go, man, oh, man. How many times are we like Naaman? How many times do we have things pretty much together, but just this thing has to be fixed, if we could get this fixed, but we want it done our way. We, we want the show. We want the, the big deal of it. We want to have a story to go back and tell everybody, this is what happened to me, and this is how it happened. You know, how's he gonna go home and say, woohoo, I jumped in a dirty river. <laughs> that's all he had there's no story there you know no write up in the paper and and uh, and I think about that for myself you know if I I have expectations about how I want God to act I want how I want him to act in your life how I want him to act in the church and in the community I've got all these ideas about okay Lord just just come to me and let me show you how you can do this and it'll make a splash you know and you know how often God tells me to go jump in a lake? <laughs> well, just about as often as you guys tell me that. Yeah, I know. Okay. So, but we get offended. We take offense at the way God works and at the way Jesus works in our life. And we're offended. And remember when, when, uh, uh, when John the Baptist was in prison and he, and, he, and he sent his disciples to Jesus and they said, Are you the one or should we look for somebody else? Because you're not doing anything we said you'd be doing. You know, can you imagine that? Should we look for somebody else? Because, you know, Jesus, you're really letting us down. I want the big deal. You know, you're not giving that. We do that so many times. You know, and, and uh, and then we try and make following Jesus such a difficult thing. 
It's got to be hard. It's got to be something. Why is it that we always think that God's will, we're afraid to pray for God's will in our life because we're afraid if we find out God's will, it's going to be something horrible. Why is that? Why, if, God, if, if you have a choice between something that's fun and easy and would really be inspiring or something crappy and terrible and hard and, and agonizing, well, which one do you think is God's will? It must be the agonizing one, right? Because this is too easy. This is too much fun. I, this is, I can just do this. That can't be God's will. I got to go over here and struggle. Because we're like Naaman. I want to struggle. I want to do the big thing. I want to have a story about how I did this. Instead of saying, I didn't do anything. I guess God just showed up. You know. And, uh, and so we want to make things harder. You know, I, I've grown up in the church, you know that, and, and uh, missionary kid, all that stuff, and pastor for way too many years. And it's always about, can we make it a bigger deal? can't just be simple. It can't just be fun. You know? And we've gotten it wrong so many times. I, I, we have a, a brother-in-law, I, I mean, uh, John Kirk is his name, and he is like the greatest locksmith that there ever was. He, he's been a locksmith since he was a kid, and then the army, and then his own businesses, and he cracks safes, and he opens locks and stuff. And he was telling us a while back that he got this call like at 2.30 in the morning to go out, uh, somebody had locked the keys to their new Mercedes Benz in the car. And I don't know if you know this, but Mercedes are really hard to break into. Uh, my dad had, had an old uh, 560 SL and it got stolen in LA, but they couldn't uh, break into it. And so they messed with it and got the alarm going and he ran out in his underwear in LA, and, uh, which is not unusual there, I guess. And, uh, and uh, they had a tow truck pulling it down the street, stealing his car in the middle of the night with the, with the horn going, bah, bah, bah. And he told the police, I mean, five days later, the police called him and said, well, we found your car. It's still beeping. They never could get in. <laughs> they couldn't pick the lock. And so they're, they're, they're famous for this, right? So our so, uh, brother-in-law, John Kirk, gets this call, goes out in the middle of the night in a brand new Mercedes, Keys are locked in, and, uh, and he's getting paid a lot for this because it's the middle of the night and it's a Mercedes and, you know, all those kind of things. So, so he's charging a lot. He goes over, fiddles with the lock, it opens. And he thinks to himself, oh, no, they're not going to want to pay my fee because this took about <laughs> 10 seconds. <laughs> and they're going to feel bad about their car, how easy it is to break into. So without saying anything, he quietly locked it back up again. <laughs> Went back to his truck, fumbled around for a while, kicked around, came back, worked on it, went back to his truck. He can't open it now. <laughs> it's, it, every, he's trying everything. He's doing all the things that he did before. It doesn't open. <laughs> now it's 3.30 in the morning and the person is going, wow, I got a pretty good car. You can't break into this very easily. Finally said, I, it, it, it opened up and I went, oh man. <laughs> but he had to make it look harder. It, would, it wouldn't have been good to just open it up and take a bunch of money and leave. You have to make it look harder. And we've done that with the Christian life, haven't we? Let's make it hard. Let's make it look hard, even if it isn't. You know, so people think we're doing a big deal. Now, I've got to tell you one more thing, okay? I know, we're going to go quick here. This leprosy thing, okay? Now, actually, I grew up in Africa. You know, we lived in a leper colony in, in Cameroon. And uh, so I actually know something about leprosy, okay? Ta -da. And uh, I, uh, we were this little kid. I remember the certificate programs where somebody could get their certificate that they're no longer contagious, you know, and they could carry that with them and we'd plod and everything like that. I wasn't allowed to go out of the house and play with kids as a, as a child. Why? Because you didn't know who had it and who didn't, you know? And so it was a very awkward thing. But uh, so I was reading this book. It was a great book called, um, Pain, the Gift Nobody Wants. By, as co-written by um, uh, Philip Yancey and Paul, Dr. Paul Brand, who went to University Press when I was there. Uh, and he's a famous doctor specializing in leprosy, and particularly in India, and uh, for a while down in, uh, in the Bayou country, which was a problem there. Um, but um, they write in this book that um, the thing about leprosy is that you have no pain. 
That's the, that's the defining characteristic. There's no pain in leprosy. And he said, nobody dies from leprosy. They die because they have no pain. So they're running along and they trip and they fall and they break their foot, their ankle. And then they just keep running because they don't feel any pain. And then pretty soon it's just the raw bone on the ground grinding and then gangrene sets in and then their legs are cut off. And, but it was only because they felt no pain so they just kept going. Or you're sitting around the campfire and you reach in because you want to get something, you drop something and you reach in the fire and you pull it out. Meanwhile, you've just burned the half your arm off, but you don't feel anything so it doesn't matter. And he, and he tells us one story where he was working with a, uh, 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 an orphanage for kids in India that had leprosy. And he said it was the weirdest thing because every once in a while kids would come down for breakfast and they'd be missing a finger or two. And they couldn't figure it out. And they called the staff together and they couldn't figure it out and everything. And so he got some people, said would you just stay up all night and watch the kids sleep? And so they did. You know what they found out? In the night, rats would come in and chew off their fingers. But because the kids didn't feel anything, they just slept right through it. And then they'd wake up and they'd be missing a, a finger. Okay, you're not gonna wanna go to brunch now. You know, that, okay. that, that just killed the, the, the buffet. <laughs> but, but, so then I think about this and I go, how many times have we tried to avoid pain in our lives? And the extent that we have gone to, to not hurt and to not hurt. Relationally, we're, we're like relational lepers sometimes, where we, where we put up barriers and walls so we don't get close to people so that we don't get rejected and then we won't hurt. Or, or, or nothing can go wrong, so we stay isolated. Or we, we become spiritual lepers, where, where we have barriers to keep God at a distance. And we don't want to get too close. Maybe we could be spiritual, kind of, but we're not going to talk about Jesus. You know, oh, man, well, that's too, too much. And, and what if I get disappointed and everything? And, and, uh, and so we block ourselves off not to hurt. We numb ourselves out, and, we, and we're spiritual and emotional lepers. And we'll die from that because we don't feel any pain. You know, we were over uh, yesterday at the... Uh, uh, not the detox center, but the recovery center for Damien who's finished his 30 days and, and uh, we're, we're visiting and talking and, and, uh, and we're talking about this whole phenomenon of the addiction stuff that, that we've been all walking through this, this last couple of months. And he said, you know, Dad, it's a way to stop hurting. That's all. The pain just gets so bad, you just want it to stop. So we use. That's all. <coughs> and then we die. Because we turn ourselves into lepers. You know? We used to have a, a quote, Damien and I used to have a quote. Uh, given a choice between nothing and pain, what would you take? And we always used to say, we'll take pain because then we're alive, which is the correct answer. Mm -hmm. I asked him the other day, between nothing and pain, what do you take? He goes, I'll take nothing. That's the wrong answer, because then we die. Now, we're gonna come alive, we're gonna come alive, if we're gonna overcome and be healed from our emotional and relational and spiritual leprosy, it means, guess what, what it mean? We're going to hurt. And we're going to hurt together. And we're not always going to feel great. And we're not going to pretend that it's all good. And we're not going to act like everything's great to keep people away. Right? Because then we're just lepers together. We're a little leper colony. Which I feel good about because I grew up in that. <laughs> so I'm fine with that. But what if we did the no big deal? The no big deal. Say, okay, Lord, have your way in my life. I don't need a show. I don't need a big deal. I don't need hard stuff. I don't need all these things. Give it a choice between nothing and pain. I'll take the pain. Come into my life. What happens? We come alive. That's what happens. 
and we can fuss and fume. You know, there were times I went away like Naaman and I said, I'm, I'm out of here, I'm down the road, I'm not doing this, blah, 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 you know. We do that all the time, right? But they would say, you know, wait a minute. Why don't we just take the Lord at his word? Why don't we just say, okay, yes. That's all we gotta do. We say yes to, to Jesus. Yes, okay, have your way in my life. See what happens. It changes everything. So, time for us to be a leper colony is over. And uh, time for us to come alive. So, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that uh, you promise us that uh, when we're, our load is heavy and we're overburdened and we're tired, that we can come to you and, um, and your, your, your load is light. Your yoke is easy, you say. So help us to, to take hold of you and let you take hold of us and transform our life and, and bring us alive and heal us of our need to deaden pain and set us free to follow you. That's our, that's our need, that's our prayer today, in Jesus' name.